last week as we prepared to go into quarantine, Father Brian made one last Walmart run to get a couple things. He sent me some photos of the shelves and they were empty, like shelf over shelf, aisle after aisle, just vacant. I myself had gone to the grocery store a couple days before and while things weren't completely gone, a lot of stuff that is normally in stock just wasn't there. I mean, it only makes sense. People are kind of getting ready for but hunkering down for a whole month and they're saying, okay, I need to have everything so that me and my family can just stay at home and be safe and protected, uh, which makes sense. One guy uh, at the grocery store was looking at hot dogs and saw them and just kind of started going away saying, oh, they don't, they don't have hot dogs. And his wife was like, no, there's hot dogs right here. And he said, no, it's, it's not the, the kind we like and just kept walking and they just left Perfectly good store brand hot dogs right there. It's, it was weird. We're in weird times right now. Our normal routines are thrown off and our habits are out of whack and we're spending more and more time at home than is normal or even natural, all to avoid a disease that can do some real damage. So it makes sense. All of this just brings with it a stress and anxiety that we don't normally encounter in our typical structure of our lives. But just like any structure or material, the real metal, the real strength is tested only under great stress. So too is our true character rising to the top now in this tumultuousness of life as it's all stripped away our guard and our normal way of doing things, exposing our raw humanity for what it is. In this nakedness of our humanity, just like our first parents, we desire to cover ourselves, to clothe ourselves with things and comforts, lest we have that bare nakedness standing before the harsh and cruel world. But Christ urges us, be not anxious for your life and what you shall eat, or for your body and what you shall wear, for life is more than food and the body is more than clothes. These worldly concerns can easily consume our minds and distract us from our true calling, our true purpose. As Pope Leo the Great wrote, the concerns of this life should not preoccupy us with its anxiety so that we no longer strive with the love of our whole heart to be like our Redeemer. This life is temporary. Life in the next with Christ is everlasting. To focus on the whole of this life with its concerns of this world and not to focus on the next would be like spending all of our time and money to focus on these next few coming weeks with no plan for the future or the rest of the year. I mean, what's the point of surviving a few weeks if there's no life for the rest of the year? Why not look at the coming year and the freedom and the joy that this life can provide when this illness passes and plan accordingly. Surely there is no year without these few weeks. If we die in these few weeks, then there is no coming year. But there's also no year if we only focus on surviving just these few weeks. Yet what Christ offers for us is more than just one year. It's an eternity of life with him in heaven. What a future Christ desires so much more for us than just this meager existence. Which is why in a few weeks here, we're gonna celebrate Easter, the resurrection, the rising of Christ. Christ came at the Annunciation, which we celebrated this past Wednesday, and became man. God took on our humanity so that he could dwell among us to then die for our sins, which will come up here in just a few weeks. God took on our humanity that he might be united with him. For our human nature is now his human nature. The body that laid lifeless in the tomb, that's ours. The body that rose again on the third day, it's ours. The body that ascended to the heights of heaven, to the right hand of the Father, is ours. From our baptism, the Spirit of God that rose Christ from the dead dwells within us. And we also raise our mortal bodies with him just as Christ rose. This is the promise that Christ, the Word of God, gave to us, that if we die with him, we shall also live with him. 
God spoke through the prophet Ezekiel in the days of old, promising to open the graves of his people and to raise them from their earthen beds, for his spirit dwells within them, and God is good to his word. But there's something here that I think we presume often that we don't really consider might not be the reality. As I said at baptism, the spirit of God makes his dwelling in us. But that doesn't preclude us from being able to oust him from ourselves, from our souls, from his desired home, and to fill in that space with other things of this world instead of its intended tenant, leaving no room for God in our hearts. But the things of this world, the flesh, these concerns, they, they're passing, they aren't lasting, and they don't please God. God desires our hearts. So if we desire to bodily rise with Christ for that bodily resurrection, we must let our hearts and spirits be resurrected first. And we resurrect from death, and so we must look at what continues to kill our hearts and our spirits, if not mortal sin. In our topsy-turvy times right now that we're living in, we find ourselves unable to do the things that we want or even what we would normally do. We're confined to limited spaces with limited people and a limited amount of materials. Maybe we find this to be a blessing because our normal sins are not a part of our lives. They're cut off or cut out, and we now have time and reason to work on our spiritual lives. But if I know human nature, and not only have I studied it, but I live it every day, We can do bad all by ourselves. While we may be physically separated from those usual sins that we commit, don't think Satan's taking a break. He is stepping up his game. If anything, in this quarantine, we will become more aware of those underlying sins and disordered desires as they boil over into our daily interactions with our family and friends now that we have this opportunity to be away from everything else. So I wanted to quickly touch on four of the seven deadly sins because I find them most apt in our current situation. First is sloth. Sloth is an aversion to work. Now, we're out of our typical work schedules and that's all disrupted and many are just working from home. So things are different, but Satan will tempt us to just slough off work in general by procrastinating or just saying, I don't really need to do that. And maybe, It's not about our jobs or school. Maybe it's just chores around the house, things that need to get done. How many times have we looked at something and said, ah, yeah, I need to get to that. I'll just watch one more episode and then I'll jump on it. Next thing we know, it's 10 p.m. and nothing got done that day. Nor does the work have to be physical. Mental sloth is also very potent, especially with the internet so easily available to us. But our minds need good things to chew on, or else our minds will wander to things that are not so good for us. But worst of all is a spiritual sloth, a laziness in prayer in our relationship with God. Even in my own life, I can't tell you how many times I said, well, I'm kind of busy right now, I'll pray later, only then to realize I've hopped into bed ready to go to sleep at the end of the day to realize I haven't prayed at all. This is a spiritual killer. Second is envy. Envy is the resenting of another's good fortune, making us internally distraught that someone else has something that we don't. Usually these aren't things that we need, it's just things that we like, and typically we're, en- we're not envious of things because we don't know they exist. We only start to envy things when we see, oh, he's got that, I want that. There's material envy, which says like, did you hear about the Smith family and their new summer home? Yeah, it's in Cabo, they have it year round. Uh, man, what must he be doing, probably something illegal, to make that kind of money? Maybe if my dad worked a little bit harder, maybe we'd have a summer home like that. Or even worse, there's spiritual envy. This is the envy we see in Martha towards her sister Mary as she sits happily at the feet of Christ while Martha is working. We also see this in our own lives when we look at other churches, other people, and resent them for doing the Lord's work in ways that we cannot or have not. It's when we say, hey, I see what they're doing. Why don't I have that? I want that. And not in a good, healthy way, like, mm, that I should do more, but like, gosh, I wish they didn't, because now they're making me look bad. 
when we say it out loud, it sounds really stupid. They're doing the Lord's work. But I see it all the time. I know so many people who think that cloistered nuns hold away in their convent are just avoiding the real world and real issues. And right now I hear it from time and time again from all over saying, uh, that church is doing this event. Why aren't we doing this event? Maybe if my father just worked harder, we'd have this event too. That is a spiritual killer. Third is greed. Like envy, greed desires things, not because others have it. Greed wants to take and to take, to accumulate, lest it lack anything, ever. Greed doesn't trust in God's providence for us, that he'll provide, but relies on oneself to provide for our needs. Typically out of a fear of not having enough. Greed bolsters us with stuff so that we can trust, not in God, but in our stuff to save us. We see this in the empty shelves of the stores. The greedy take more than they could ever use. Spiritual greed is not something we typically run into, but it can and does happen. Spiritual greed doesn't rely or trust on God to save us. It relies on holy practices and holy objects to protect us. Again, this sounds absurd, especially since we know that our salvation only comes through the person of Jesus Christ. But that doesn't stop some from trying. The greedy take and take and never actually use. The person who suffers from spiritual greed will take all the classes on prayer, buy all the DVDs from Bishop Barron, do all the devotions, all the prayers. They will do everything they can, listen to all the Catholic podcasts, have Bibles, have scriptures, have crucifixes. And none of these things are bad in themselves, but spiritually, the greed doesn't allow them to actually grow in their relationship with God through any of these things. They go through the motions so as to say, yes, I need these things, but they never actually enter into relationship with our Savior. They've accumulated holy things without letting those things make them holy. That's a spiritual killer. Last for today is gluttony. It's like greed in that gluttony takes and takes, but gluttony doesn't want to accumulate like greed does. Gluttony takes more and more, more than it can handle because of the pleasure that it brings. We see this materially in overeating, in overdrinking, in overindulging in social media. It's the living out of the adage, too much of a good thing. The gluttonous will overconsume to the point of being physically ill. Spiritual gluttony does similar things. It overengages in spiritual practices out of their depth. Like I said last week, our spiritual lives are like a tree, and the tree needs water to live. But you can kill a tree by overwatering it. God knows that and he doesn't desire to overwater us, but we do it to ourselves. Have you ever listened to your new favorite songs on repeat so many times that you got sick of it and you just don't enjoy it anymore? That's what gluttony does. It overconsumes the good thing until we're sick of it. So too does spiritual gluttony feed us good spiritual things, but in a manner and a quantity that ends up making us sick of it all. We bite off more than we can chew and then become discouraged by our failure to do it all. Because there is a ton of spiritual depth to our faith, and it's easy to drown in it. Like physical training, we grow in strength incrementally. So too do our spiritual lives grow grander and grander, but in the small ways. The spiritual glutton becomes bloated with spiritual practices that they can no longer move about in the freedom of Christ. They can no longer actually do it all. This is a spiritual killer. Yet, as Ezekiel reminds us, God takes no pleasure in the death of the sinner, but rather desires that the sinner turn back to God from his sin and live. Even with everything else shutting down, we here at St. Michael's are still offering confessions so that we can turn back to God and live. Johnson County considers this pastoral counseling and care an essential feature of the life of the county, but we still want to be smart and safe about it. We're doing drive-up confessions during all our confession time so that you can stay in your car and call us on the phone so that we can see you in order to maintain our quarantines. Check the website for more times. But for one reason or another, if you can't make it to confession, do not despair. God is not limited to his sacraments, even though they are assured means of his graces. 
If you cannot make it to confession, make a perfect act of contrition, recognizing your true sorrow for your sins, not out of fear of hell, but out of love for God, and firmly resolve to go to confession at your next possible opportunity. No one, however weak, is denied a share in the victory of the cross. No one is beyond the help of the prayer of Christ. Look at Lazarus from our gospel today. He was dead for four days. Even his own sisters, who had a deep faith in Christ's ability to save and to resurrect Lazarus on the last day, were reticent to allow Jesus to work in an uninspected way that they weren't anticipating. Even amidst this crisis, Christ wants to work in your life. The Spirit of God desires to dwell within us all. We must, however, clear house of all the things of this world in our hearts and make room for the Spirit to move and to breathe life back into our fleshy bodies. I urge you, brothers and sisters, be open to how God wants to move and work in your lives today. Do not fall into sloth waiting until tomorrow. Do not surround yourselves with the trappings of holiness without letting them work on your soul. Do not overconsume the good things God is giving you, nor be jealous of the spiritual lives that others have. Keep your eyes focused on Christ, for he is our salvation. Stay safe and healthy, and may God bless you all.